although there were already some amorphous patterns in the marketplace, there was nothing that had come before like this. It was looking at a source of pattern making that was dependent upon seeing what happened in molecules. So it was that interest in the miniature, in revealing things, in finding a new vision for a new world. And it was optimistic. It was really about having great faith in the future. The Festival Pattern Group was formed in 1949 with a view to creating liaisons between different kinds of manufacturers. And in the end, there were 28 manufacturers, 11 of which came from the textile industry. That had been Britain's largest export industry. And so it was important for them because they, the whole thrust of this was to renew their strength in exports. And they had not just textiles to export, but they also had their scientific skill. Part of the point of this was that Britain led in crystallographic research. So they wanted to sell that. So although there were 11 textile manufacturers, three potters, people doing glass, you know, other sorts of things, carpets, tiles, and whatever, each one was intended to represent a slightly different section of the market. So within textiles, there was a linen manufacturer, there was cotton, there was the great silk manufacturer, Warners, although they did other things. And each one was divided into their own sector so that they wouldn't be competing. Instead, they would be working together to develop products that matched in color, that crossed over from plastics into wallpaper to textiles with glass backgrounds matching for mica and so on. It was the first time that anyone really attempted to make a suite of design products that were all meant to work together in an integrated way. One of the great things that textiles in particular and wallpapers do is they make an interior human. They make it more than habitable. They make it comfortable and safe and secure and snug. Well, a lot of the scientific changes that had occurred in the mid-century were really rather alarming things. The dropping of the bomb is in recent memory. It's only six years earlier. And yet already you can see the great strides forward that science is making. The same kind of science is bringing greater health and greater prosperity and greater security to everyone. So what is interesting about these patterns is that they are in the main uh, produced from cross sections or slices through the crystal structure. But it renders that scary process really benign, even friendly, and it makes ordinary people able to feel that they can embrace and understand what is really a, an almost inexplicable process. It is, it is a difficult piece of science. That's one of the great legacies of this project, is that it allows those sorts of patterns to communicate, to create a new visual language that embraces people and brings them closer to the science of the second half of the 20th century. The one that was deemed to be the best or the most well-known pattern was one by Marion Straub. I'm holding a little sample of it here. It was taken from Affelwhite. Marion's view was the reason it was deemed to be the most successful was because it had a big exposure in the Regatta restaurant. It covered large expanses of the walls there. Uh, so it was the one that was most associated with the, the key interior that was there to promote the festival pattern group. It's a very large-scale pattern, and this is only a small piece of it. But nevertheless, you can see how artfully she's used the texture in the background. You can see that she's stepped down the diagonals in one direction here to create a beautiful, simple, subtle uh, movement. And then she's stepped them up in this direction in the pattern. And this also means that when they hang, they'll have a lovely fluidity because these diagonals will encourage the cloth to fall into beautiful fat folds. They didn't make it into commercial production because it really was an idea created by an engineer for the design industry. So perhaps its timing was a little bit wrong, or perhaps it was a little bit overambitious. All of these manufacturers were really dependent on exports, and they were not, on the whole, proactive. They were reactive manufacturers. They wanted large orders before they committed to expensive stocks of patterns. So the ceramics industry, for example, really couldn't afford to produce a lot of these and just sit them on the shelves in hopes that someone might buy them. Despite the fact that they weren't commercially successful, they did have this enormous impact because we know that 8.5 million visitors attended the South Bank, and if you include the land traveling exhibition that went around the country and various other events, there were 18.5 million people who saw this exhibition. It seems that the audience was largely from the working class. 
every manufacturer bust their employees down there. So this was important because it was the first time, consciously or unconsciously, that there was a really big exhibition that promoted non-elitist design. And that was a real breakthrough. And it really does define what's happened with the high street and design for that's consumer-led ever since that period up to today. There were several long-term influences from the exhibition. The first is in relation to color, the point about having things that matched each other across different products. That was really innovative. The second was about the development of these new plastic and plasticized textiles, um, leather cloth, uh, formica, these kinds of objects, even the, the impressed glass. Um, all these small patterns really became the standard pattern for these objects. They were new objects in themselves, and so a new pattern was perfectly appropriate for them. Other things like dress textiles and furnishing textiles, well, they moved on with fashion. They changed. But these more utilitarian products, they retained uh, this vocabulary of small, uh, broken-up, scientific patterns. And you can still see those today.